has a PhD in physics, but he is no ordinary physicist, as we'll soon be finding out. In recent years, he has brought all that great knowledge about physics and, and into his real passion, which is bringing the, the physics into the realm of the paranormal. And he's actually personally experimented with the paranormal. We'll be hearing about that. Hopefully he can give us today an understanding that the myth and folklore and all the stories we've heard about the paranormal abilities and capacities of the demigods and the gods, the telepathy, clairvoyance, really have a basis in science. Dr. Swanson will share with us today the science of the spiritual realms. And in ancient times, science and spirituality were not separated concepts, but they were really one truth, and it was known that way. And so now I introduce to you Dr. Claude Swanson. Thank you, Heidi. Can those in the back here, okay? So, um, the the uh, topic that I've been working on uh, for the last 25 years, really, is the science of the paranormal, which is a short term for the things that our current science doesn't really recognize or understand. Um, I started out uh, my life um, as a young boy in Virginia looking up at the stars at night in the rural area. Things are so clear, you can see all the stars. When you spin around in the summertime, you'll notice the stars appear to spin around you. Um, and of course you feel this force. Your arms are pulled up from your side. That's what we call centrifugal force. And I noticed you only feel that force when the stars appear to be spinning in your frame of reference. I always wondered even then, is there some connection between the appearance of motion of the stars and that force that we feel? It opened up the idea that maybe things that are very far away affect the forces that are nearby. Uh, my curiosity took me to college at MIT and and grad school in, in, in Princeton, uh, trying to learn all the physics I could to satisfy my curiosity about the universe, how it really worked at the deepest level. That was my passion. When I got finished, I, I was disappointed. It felt like a lot of the theories were superficial. They, they were almost like, like fitting after the fact that the things people had measured in the laboratory, a lot of the deep satisfying ideas seemed to be missing. I didn't really feel I got an explanation. I kept working on my own ideas and uh, in the mid, mid 1980s I came across some things that did not fit what I'd been taught in school. One of them was remote viewing which you could basically communicate access information across space and time over huge distances. A lot of the things I was learning in the mid 80s violated the physics I had learned, but it was a clue to what the new physics ought to look like, and it gave me an idea about what I should be incorporating into the new science. Since then, I spent the last 20 years trying to find all of the, um, in every different possible area, uh, what the evidence is, what the real solid evidence is uh, for phenomena. So the back is loud enough, am I correct? You can hear okay out back there? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm used to having a handheld mic, and I'm a little nervous with this little neck thing. I can't see it. So, um, the um, the net result basically is a book, the Synchronized Universe, where I pull together the best evidence uh, for a lot of the paranormal phenomena, evidence that shows that we really are uh, beginning a new age. Our old science is becoming obsolete, and something new is replacing it. Uh, at the same time, of course, we're facing tremendous environmental uh, difficulties, uh, and the Hopi prophecy to me seems to sum up the crisis that we're in. Uh, the, one of the Hopi uh, petroglyphs shows Western man with his head detached from his body. Uh, the meaning of it is interpreted as our, our, our spiritual wisdom we must come back into contact with. Western man is living in a sort of scientific attitude toward the world, and we must recover uh, that, uh, that spiritual side of life. Okay, that does raise the volume. Okay, I do believe that. <laughs> okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so the question is, can we bridge these two uh, worlds, the scientific world and the spiritual world? A mainstream science today sees the world as made of matter and forces. There are rigid laws. There's no real place for consciousness, even though some physicists will tell you that consciousness is in quantum mechanics. Uh, the truth is that after a very brief uh, acknowledgement that consciousness can cause the wave function to collapse, that's the last you hear of consciousness in physics classes. And they go on pretending that consciousness has no effect in physics beyond that. Um, so our Western paradigm really is, is kind of, it's in overdue for a change, uh, has no understanding of some of the things that we're now learning in other fields, the power of consciousness, uh, the soul, things that are important in spiritual belief systems and often show up in direct experiences, mystical experiences, but, um, but, have, but have no place in current science. So this is part of this bridging of the rift between the two uh, fields of belief. But laboratory experiments today are proving that some of these mystical phenomena are actually real and can be demonstrated in the lab and it's going to force our physics uh, into a new paradigm shift and to a very radical different theory which will then allow uh, a, a, a healing of this rift between the science and the spirituality. It's a new scientific revolution and it's going to, because in the West our belief system is so based on the scientific outlook, as we change our science it'll also help the major mainstream culture to shift. Um, also, if we look back into records of ancient times, the, the stories of the Vimanas, the stories of uh, the wizards in the Druid times, all ancient cultures have legends that we call magic today. Our mainstream culture acts as though these things didn't really happen. What our new science is learning is that, you know, actually they may have happened because we're learning how to do them again today. So we're relearning some of the ancient magic of the old stories. So we're kind of recovering some of the lost knowledge of the old ages as this new science begins to unfold. So what's the evidence that this revolution is about to happen? Uh, first, first in the hard sciences, what are some of the areas where we have indications that it's that the current science is failing, a dark matter. Twenty years ago I was taught that you know, we understand the forms of matter. Now we know between 50 and 95 percent of the universe is a form we don't understand at all called dark matter and dark energy. As uh, Richard just explained to you, uh, the law of gravity is broken during solar eclipses. Uh, pendulums behave in a way that uh, our science today cannot explain. It's a clue that something very seriously is, is wrong with gravity theory. Cold fusion, 1989, was announced to the world that uh, cold fusion worked. Then very soon after that, within a few months, Department of Energy funded two groups who just happened to be in an area that was competing with cold fusion for funding, uh, did uh, tests where they claimed that it failed we know now that one of those two groups actually fudged their data. They were getting positive results. They subtracted those out in the final report. Uh, cold fusion really does work. There's over 500 labs around the world that have replicated it at this point. We don't know how it works. Our current physics can't explain it. Uh, charge clusters, one more area where current physics is breaking down. You learn in basic physics that like charges repel each other. Um, but what happens when you take enough billions and billions of electrons of the same size, push them very close to each other, they stop repelling. They actually stick together. Uh, and when they hit a metal plate, they drill into it. Make a hole like that. Uh, so this is a physics that is, we don't currently understand in mainstream physics. Not only that, but as they hit and land in a pure aluminum plate, more and more charges hit that plate, they start causing 
fusion events. They actually, the lower graph shows how um, the material in the plate starts to develop new materials that were not there to start with because fusion is actually occurring. Uh, what we believe is that the, the vacuum energy, the zero point energy is modified when you have that many charges close together. It changes the, the normal physics um, and it also gives some clues about how some new energy sources could be developed. Uh, one more area, cosmology. The current wisdom is that quasars are the furthest things away from us at the edge of our universe. But here is a photograph from Halton Arp, a respected astronomer, showing a nearby, a nearby galaxy and then three of these quasars that are supposed to be much further away, but they're all connected by dust jets one to the other, indicating that they're not really as far away as conventional cosmology would tell us. The speed of light has been broken in a number of experiments. Um, and uh, here's a patent diagram from a Japanese inventor named Kawaii. He got a US patent for this. He calls it a very efficient generator. <laughs> he, he, did not, he did not ask for a patent for a free energy device because he wouldn't have gotten it. But in the text of his patent, he mentions tests they did where they get out three times more energy than they put in. So this is really extracting energy from the vacuum. If this is zero point energy, it's the beginning of a whole new field where we're engineering the vacuum of space and it's part of the new paradigm shift, part of the new revolution in physics. In paranormal phenomena, the anomalies are even greater. Remote viewing, which got me interested in the first place. I took several courses in remote viewing. Uh, this is one uh, drawing I did. I added the colors later, but the drawing shows a a bright light in the distance. There are Roman soldiers in the foreground frantically building a barricade. Something dangerous is approaching. And the last thing I got was destruction of Pompeii, which was correct. Uh, I'm not a great remote viewer, but I had enough successes like that to know that it works. The government found that it works very well, and the CIA and Defense Department uh, funded a 20-year program. The great remote viewers, they did a selection process of maybe a couple percent um, of the people they tested are great remote viewers. The middle one here is Pat Price. That's Hal Putoff on the right in the picture of the physicist who helped start this program. Uh, you can get very clear vision, very accurate information. Distance is not a limitation. Time is not a limitation. You can look into the future. You can look into the past. You can look through walls. Uh, you can look on other planets with high accuracy, amazingly enough. Uh, a CIA report afterwards, they tried to debunk it, but one of the two uh, scholars who looked at it, Jessica Utz, University of California, statistician, concluded it works, works very well. Um, the Princeton Pear Lab, uh, Robert John and Brenda Dunn, have done some of the most extensive testing to show with average people, not with highly trained remote viewers, average people, uh, the, the effects are weaker, but you still have accuracy. There's an accuracy you can't explain by chance for remote viewing and ESP. And if you separate the targets in time or in space, the accuracy does not diminish with increasing time separation or increasing space separation. And here's a summary of some of their data over a, a period of time. The odds that there's a little hump on the right, the little red curve, that is showing the data that cannot be accounted for by chance. It's things that are more accurate than they should be by chance. The big black curve is kind of showing the average Gaussian randomness. So these are average viewers. There's a lot of randomness, a lot of mistakes there, but there's something there, an accuracy you can't explain by chance. The odds of that curve are 55 billion to one that it could occur by chance. So there's a real effect here. Um, Edgar Mitchell, uh, Apollo astronaut, conducted the longest distance ESP experiment, about 200,000 miles on his way back from the moon. He also got high accuracy, which shows again that this effect does not seem to care about distance. Uh, Dean Radin is one of the scientists who's done a lot of studies. Uh, this one shows that uh, with psychic phenomena, a lot of different ways of testing it, you get effects that are real that again, chance cannot explain. Bob John, who ran the Princeton Pear Lab and uh, also 
former head of the engineering department at Princeton, uh, concludes all forces known to physics, like gravity, for example, diminish with distance. And no forces in physics operate freely across time like this. It's as if consciousness is somehow able to direct its influence directly across space and time, an understanding that poses a challenge for current science. So this is a new kind of a force. Uh, one of the remarkable aspects of this force now is that it also depends on time of day. That you could have, there's a certain time of day when your reception as an ESP or a psychic or remote viewer is the best. And it depends on the position of the stars. And a statistician named Spottiswood compiled a huge amount of remote viewing and ESP data and found there's a peak inaccuracy. And it occurs, as shown on the graph here, Orion and Sirius are setting. Uh, Virgo is overhead, the constellation Virgo. The tail, the top two tails, the last two tail stars of the Big Dipper handle are kind of vertical. It's 13.5 hours sidereal. So it depends upon star time, not clock time or the, the time of the sun. It's where the stars are. This happens to also be the time when the great attractor is overhead, which is an anomalous area of dark energy. Um, and so we, we, we're very early in trying to understand this observation, but it's an important clue. It tells us what makes psychic phenomena work the best. Um, and one possible interpretation here uh, could be an explanation for the Yuga cycle that we've been talking about so much at this conference, uh, because uh, if this dark matter and dark energy that's coming toward us from that region of the sky, uh, our, in our, if we are on a binary orbit, 26,000 year or 24,000 year orbit, at some part of that orbit we're heading toward that region, at other parts we're heading away, which means there's a Doppler shift. So we're kind of Doppler shifting the energy from that region of sky, and it's possible that, that may, because we know that part of the sky seems to enhance psychic ability, maybe our orbit is modulating that effect. So it's a possible explanation. And uh, you know, we're early on in trying to understand some of this stuff. But uh, one thing we know is that psychic phenomena, psychic ability, is widespread. Everyone has it. Um, these are measurements measuring the brain waves of subjects. Uh, the top curve shows when you play a tone. And they respond, they hear the tone, the brain responds, recognizes, I hear a tone. The bottom curve shows when you send them a psychic message. The EEG responds and indicates the brain received it. If you ask the average person, they didn't receive it. They don't know about it. Their conscious mind is unaware, but their subconscious mind got it and showed on the graph that it did. So this is why my meditation or hypnosis, methods of quieting the mind are important to help us connect and listen to these messages that we're all receiving. So ESP is basically widespread. Another wonderful series of experiments that show the reality of psychic phenomena, Cleve Baxter, a polygraph expert, uh, found that when he wired his plants up to a polygraph machine, they responded uh, to his intentions. When he thought about cutting off one of the leaves or burning a leaf, the plant went crazy. He didn't have to move. Just forming the serious thought in his mind made the difference. And this is the type of graph that he was getting from his little plant, uh, which are very empathic, it turns out. The Princeton Pear Lab did experiments on how our mind can affect things at a distance. This is a, like a vertical pinball machine with balls dropping. The, the pileup is random at the bottom, but operators can, by focusing on how they want the balls to land, affect the distribution. That has led to what they call a random event generator, or REG, which is like a, a little noise maker that makes electronic noise and records it. It's like flipping coins, like flipping coins very rapidly and then recording the results. They'll ask their operators to attempt to make the flips go high, more ones than zeros, or go low, more zeros than ones. Or if you're not doing anything, you get the middle curve. And they're finding real effects. These, these effects are measurable, they're provable, and they don't weaken with distance. Uh, typically, you know, five, 6,000 miles away, the operators get just as good results as in the next room. 
uh, Ingo Swan, one of the great remote viewers uh, who helped the government start its program, has shown that you can also, your consciousness can penetrate barriers. This is uh, a mu metal shielded uh, device at Stanford Research Institute. Uh, he was able to affect this device. It had superconducting shielding, lead shielding, and Ingo would remote view the device, describe what he saw inside, and as he would look at each piece in his mind, the output of this device went crazy. It had never shown any disturbances before in years of operation. Um, another scientist in France took a random event generator like this and allowed it to be the steering mechanism for a little robot. The robot would move around in a rectangular uh, pen and the random event numbers would cause the robot to steer left and right. This is an overview. The top figure shows the path the robot took in just normal operation. It just went randomly. Then he took some baby chicks. When they were one day old, he exposed them to this little robot. They bond with it. They think it's their mother. Then he put them in the cage on the right-hand side in the lower figure. And then he put his robot in the pen and allowed it to operate. The only interpretation here is the robot was hovering around the cage. Apparently the chicks were able to affect the random event generator and cause the robot to hover near them. So it shows that it's not just us that have these abilities. Uh, when you have many people thinking together on the same thought, it affects things even more strongly. And this is just some data from the uh, O.J. Simpson trial uh, where the, when, the, when the Nielsen ratings were high, uh, the random event generators showed correlation that cannot be explained uh, in any other way. Uh, this has gone now to, there's a group called the Global Consciousness Project, Dean Radin, Roger Nelson, and some others. They have a network of these random event generators around the world. When 9-11 happened, they began seeing anomalies several hours before the plane actually hit. Uh, and at the time of, of, and we believe the effect here is that it's the consciousness of the world. Somehow we're anticipating the event that's, that's going to be an important event. But uh, another way of processing the data uh, in terms of odds against chance, you get this huge spike at the time of 9-11 that showed that globally there was a huge concentration of thought on the event. So our minds are able to affect space-time, because these devices are measuring quantum noise, which is something that in our current physics should be, uh, you shouldn't be able to change it. But consciousness is able to affect quantum noise at the deepest level. Uh, synchronized prayer, one more way to affect these random event generators in a measurable way. Um, and this um, has led me to the suggestion that um, if we want one way of affecting the world in a positive way is to organize synchronized prayer. And we can synchronize our prayer around the world at the, at the same time, so it has maximum effect. Uh, you can even choose the time that you're synchronized at to uh, focus on a, a particular part of the world, because we know that uh, a certain part of the world at any one moment will be at that 13.5 hour sidereal where Virgo's overhead, that will be most sensitive to reception. So anyway, there's a, there's a website, globalpeaceprayer.com, where I, I propose this and, and talk about uh, how to do it. Uh, Dean Radin has shown that we're also precognitive. If you show images on a computer screen, we begin reacting physiologically uh, about three seconds before we see the, the image. Uh, healing, one more method that we have a lot of evidence now, uh, energy healing, Reiki, things of this type work. They work at distance as well as nearby, and they have real measurable effects. Uh, the Chinese did uh, a survey of their population back in the 80s to find highly talented psychic abilities. Uh, and they have done demonstrations for VIP visitors with even more remarkable effects, including teleportation and uh, levitation, things like that. So there was one man named Zhang who, for visitors, would teleport a 100-pound bag of, of sugar or flour through a wall. But um, anyway, these remarkable things. And unfortunately, these things are usually kept behind closed doors, by and large. We get little stories that come out occasionally about them. Um, 
Yuri Geller did do a teleportation, successful, uh, under controls with British physicists in 74. National Research Council did report that. We have lots of credible stories through history of levitation. Uh, this is one brother of Joseph of Copertino. Uh, the Pope investigated this. It was a very serious investigation uh, for sainthood. Hundreds of people under fear of eternal damnation swore that they'd seen him. He used to, he had a problem basically during mass. He would start levitating and fly around the church. And, and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't really control it very well. And so they made him sit in the back, but it didn't always work. Um, one of the, in terms of getting a science, how do we get from our, this into our science, what we're learning is the subtle energy appears to be the key. This has gone by many names over the years. When subtle energy is concentrated, it changes the laws of physics. Um, subtle energy is like the blind man and the elephant because it does manifest it, itself in different ways based upon what you're measuring. Um, It'll be difficult for Western science to get used to this idea because our, conscious, our consciousness does affect our instruments um, and our instruments may begin to react in a way that shows independence of mind, which will be interesting for uh, scientists to get used to. Uh, there are many people who have rediscovered this energy over the years. Baron von Reichenbach in Germany, uh, Victor Schauberger, uh, Wilhelm Reich in, in Europe and the US, Nikolai Kozarev, who Richard just mentioned a while ago in Russia, Robert Pavlita, an inventor in Czechoslovakia, uh, William Tiller in the US, and others. Um, and of course the yogis and shaman have known about it for a long time. Uh, when you do pranayama, you build up this energy in your body. And that allows you to do healing, levitation, other things like that. It goes by many names. And uh, you know, time density is one of the names that Kozarev used. Deltrons is a name that Bill Tiller used. Prana and Chi are more familiar names for this same energy. Uh, it's the energy that's used in martial arts to protect yourself. The fellow on the right here is being attacked by his fellow students in an exercise. He's using his Chi to protect himself. It is the energy that flows through our acupuncture meridians and is the key to, to life and how our our metabolism and life processes are so efficient. Um, and now we're learning some of the physics behind acupuncture. So instead of having skeptics say that they've never found acupuncture, uh, we have uh, a high, high frequency, high resolution ultrasonic images where we're able to actually see the acupoints in the body ultrasonically and when they're stimulated they go through a, an elongation and a rotation which is exciting and you can actually watch it propagate along the meridian. Other groups have been able now to isolate the organ that carries this energy, the meridian of acupuncture in the body. We know that when you apply this energy, it changes water, it changes the bond angles between hydrogen atoms in the water molecule, so it modifies water in a measurable way. Uh, some experts can project this energy over a distance. This is a measurements by uh, Dr. Xin Yan in, uh, in China. A bunch of physicists put up lithium fluoride detectors around the room 30, 40 feet away. And during his lecture about how he, how he projected chi, he would project it at the different detectors and they were able to measure uh, huge effects 40 times above background. So it is a measurable effect. Uh, one of the pioneers who in the West began experimenting uh, with this energy is Baron von Reichenbach. He wanted to see it. He wanted to find a way to see what this stuff looks like and how it behaves. First of all, he found sensitives. He looked for people who were good at being able to see the energy. They're kind of like psychics, you know, and one way he tested them was take a business card, put it on your fingers, and then allow the energy to flow through your fingers, through the card. The card, if, if you're good, will rotate. And uh, I've, I've actually, I'm, I'm not very good at this, but um, there's, a, there's a way to cheat to improve your, your results because Reichenbach also uh, learned about polarity system of the body, which is based on this energy. You can take certain materials that have opposite polarity, put it in the opposite hand. I took five charcoal briquettes, which are the opposite polarity, and then put the business card on my hand and in two out of three attempts got it to go halfway around. But those would be the tests he would do to find good sensitives. Then they would light a dap. They would spend several hours in absolute darkness. Then he would do
do demonstrations or experiments, and they would describe what they saw. In this one example, there's a copper wire going outside to the sunshine. Inside this darkened room, the sensitives would describe a light coming out of the wire. This is not electricity, it's not any form of energy that we know, and it can't be photographed, unfortunately, but the sensitives could see it and describe it in great detail. Uh, crystals create or collect this energy as well. The sharp point of a large quartz crystal uh, generates a, a bluish light, which is not conventional light. Again, it, it is this odic light, this, this subtle energy light. Uh, I managed to reproduce this experiment too, get very relaxed. I used a bathtub and meditation and stuff and in a real dark room. And after a couple of hours, you'll start to see a little bluish light from the tip of the crystal. And the weird thing about it is that you can't focus on it. It has an elusive quality to it. It's a bluish gray light. Um, they would describe uh, magnets as uh, emitting this energy in, in two forms, two colors, uh, the bluish and the reddish. The bluish is a Neg a negative entropic. It's a cold energy. It sort of violates our current physics. The red energy uh, is, a, is a positive, a warm energy. Um, and so there's these two polarities of this energy. Lots of experiments that Reichenbach did with this. Uh, a Czech inventor, Robert Pavlita, used a lot of this information to develop inventions. Uh, a typical invention, uh, he, he, he was an ESP machine. You basically put the, a little slow-moving arm over five uh, psychic pattern cards and then go into the other room. If you charge up the thing with your energy by touching it, for example, this device will very slowly hover and, and stop over the card that you're focusing on. So it's like a little ESP reception device with an accuracy of 100%. If you go back to the classic book by Ostrander and Schroeder, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain, 1970, they talk about meeting Pavlita, uh, but there's lots of supporting data that these things really work. Um, dowsing, one more phenomena that our current science can't really explain. The Germans found that if you, that if you pick very good dowsers, and maybe one or two percent are really good, you can find water more accurately and cheaper than any other technology. Um, the same energy flows through the ground we heard talks yesterday about electricity flowing through the ground, which is absolutely real, but uh, this subtle energy also appears to flow through the ground and is probably part of the whole lay energy system and is part of what's being engineered uh, with the uh, ancient stone circles. Uh, we believe it's part of what creates that sacred space, that feeling that you're entering another dimension. Because subtle energy really has that ability to change our laws, especially when they're concentrated in large quantities of subtle energy to make things, to, to give you access to other dimensions. And I'll give you some examples in a few minutes. Uh, Victor Schauberger, the man called the water wizard, uh, developed a, a curved pipe. It's shaped like a ram's horn. It has a, a spiral and then inside that another spiral. And what he found is that you can pass water through this pipe uh, with less drag, less friction than a normal straight pipe. Not only that, but at certain speeds, it actually comes out the pipe faster than you put it in. In other words, the pipe acts like a pump. It's a free energy device. There was a German professor, this was in the late 20s, who was very upset with these claims and got a funding from the German government to test them independently. And these are his data. And he found that at a certain velocity of flow, uh, there was a negative friction. So there's um, what Schauberger discovered once again was how to create this subtle energy, how to collect it. And um, he built it into a, a series of devices where once it goes through one time, he recirculated, pump it back through again. And he has a device inside this little machine that rotates like the old rotating water sprinklers, but each of the arms has this spiral. And so but this, in this way, he would build up this energy concentration in his device it would become very cold. It would run by itself because it's, it's at this right velocity of flow, it's creating energy. It would turn cold, it would start to glow, this bluish glow, and after a while it would levitate. Amazingly enough, I know it probably sounds amazing, the German government, this is in the 30s, Hitler uh, supposedly grabbed it and uh, did not include Schauberger, but did take his chief uh, machinist into experiments, and after the war, the machinist came back and told 
Schauberger, what they did, and they did make some of the German UFOs, apparently, from this technology. So subtle energy has these amazing properties to affect gravity, to affect thermodynamics. Um, you heard from Richard also, just the last talk, about uh, Kozarev, uh, Nikolai Kozarev in Russia, uh, who's apparently using the same type of energy. He calls it time density. It's also been called torsion. Um, which can actually, there are certain types of processes that, that build up one polarity of time density and other processes that build up the opposite polarity of time density. Uh, so that we have a, a law in thermodynamics in our current physics that says that entropy, the randomness, has to always increase. But what Kozarev finds is that certain types of processes, if you treat them in a certain way, you can actually get negative entropy. And uh, that, that's the bluish light that uh, von Reichenbach talked about and that Schauberger uh, mentioned. One more of these pioneers, Wilhelm Reich. He uh, discovered that the same energy comes from the sun. You can collect it, it's around us. Um, when you breathe it and, and in prana, in pranayama, that's the energy that you're collecting in your body. Uh, in certain types of devices, you can also build up a concentration of it. When you do, you can begin to find strange phenomena happening. Batteries go dead. Normal non-magnetic metals become magnetic. Um, it also affects radioactivity. Geiger counters begin to go crazy. Um, a lot of strange phenomena uh, that Reich uncovered as well. And the reason I'm going kind of quickly over these different phenomena, it's like the, 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 the blind man and the elephant. You have to look at this phenomena from different directions to be able to see what the unifying principles are. Um, William Tiller, a former professor of material science at Stanford, uh, developed a device where basically you, by meditating, you have four good meditators, uh, and you take a, a programmable EEPROM device, uh, you can freeze in the programming to it and actually cause it to affect things in a way that is controllable by the way you, by, by your intention when you froze in the programming. Uh, this is a device, a little sketch of it here. Uh, in this particular experiment, they were programming it to change the pH of water. And the data is showing that it did change the pH by the amount they asked it to and in the direction. They also managed to do other things with the same device by programming it differently to change the biology of fruit flies. Uh, one thing he found is that when these devices run day after day, they begin to change the space of the laboratory. It begins to build up, again, this concentration of subtle energy in the laboratory. And you see some truly bizarre effects. Uh, temperature begins to oscillate in the lab. Uh, other, other physical measurements that should not change begin to oscillate. But even stranger, if there's been a contact between two laboratories hundreds of miles apart, the oscillations start to become synchronized in the different laboratories. Uh, so what we're seeing here, what, what Tiller proposes as a way to explain this is what physicists call a, uh, you know, a, 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 a gauge, a changing of the gauge, a raising of the gauge. We take our current physics and we modify it by how much subtle energy is there. We increase the dimensionality of the physics and that couples in consciousness. So subtle energy affects all these different forces in physics. And uh, basically, it's the key to understanding the auras and the chakras and the higher dimensions that um, are key to awareness and psychic phenomena. I'm just going to go very quickly through a lot of this stuff here, unfortunately. But um, uh, Curlian photography is a way to, to see some of these auras. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know a lot of these things. Um, but uh, there have been some whole body curling experiments where a person stands on a platform with high voltage. You can actually see the aura when they go out of body. Uh, that also uh, has been detected. We've been also able to detect the outer body or the astral body in other experiments now to show that during remote viewing, there is that real aspect of us, our conscious body, that actually goes out of body during experiments and can be measured and sets off uh, physical devices. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through some of these things. Near-death experiences, evidence of higher dimensions, of survival of the soul. Here's a nice photograph of an orb which uh, can't be explained 
as electrostatic um, uh, effect in the atmosphere. Uh, a bunch of us were trying to get pictures of orbs uh, near a cemetery. Uh, one day, the little adults, we spent the whole day, we saw some things, didn't have any success. One of the 12-year-olds in our group was walking back to her cabin, saw this thing hovering in front of the cabin. It's about a three-foot diameter orb in daylight. She said, I thought it wanted me to take its picture. So she snapped its picture, then the orb moved away, and then she forgot about it until the pictures came back three days later. But in this picture, you can see the front column of the uh, cabin through the orb. You can see the daylight reflecting, the trees reflecting in it, and the ground reflecting in it. That's a remarkable picture. So there's some orbs that, are con that show consciousness, basically. They show controllability. They interact with us. Uh, this is taken in the basement of a haunted house. I had a night shot Sony video camera. I was with a very expert ghost hunter who was getting lots of orb pictures. I said, I'm not getting any, I'm not seeing anything. Then at that moment he says, will an orb please show up for Claude's camera? <laughs> and within a couple of seconds, this little uh, uh, white dot, which has a white circle added later, showed up in the middle of my screen. In the next uh, three or four seconds, it sort of leisurely moved toward me and off to the right. I got about 30 or 40 frames of video of it. So I believe they really do have consciousness and they, they really are you know, that aspect of consciousness that persists after death. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that at least some orbs have that quality. Um, sometimes ghosts can be photographed. This is a vortex uh, ghost that well, photographed in a farmhouse that I and some friends owned. It's the most haunted house we ever uh, came across. A lot of strange phenomena happened there. Uh, if you look very closely, this image is visible because it's actually twisting the light behind it. The clapboards on the wall of the farmhouse behind it are being twisted up. So this figure is actually bending light, which is something our science can't explain. Uh, but again, it's a subtle energy effect. Um, we have the technology now to communicate with the dead. Uh, this is technology that's really advancing rapidly. Um, we know that um, a lot of evidence that we survive death. Um, this is a, a, a scene taken at the moment of death, and there are orbs uh, which are leaving the body. This has been observed by people who do hospice work frequently. Uh, so the conclusion, there is no death. Life continues. Um, one group who, of course, know a lot more about this are the adepts, the ones who have really uh, done the work to master these higher dimensions, to master the ability uh, with this energy. Um, Sri Yukteswar, who's been mentioned several times, uh, talks about uh, the, the physics that we have in the Western science, but there's also a higher, a higher science which involves consciousness. And um, I, I think that's where we're sort of on the edge of now, is trying to transition from one to the other. They see the universe as comprised of many higher dimensions. Um, as far as the theory goes, I'll go very briefly through this. My, the last chapter of my book has the theory in more detail, but basically, you know, Einstein said with all humility, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research, would we? So, um, I think intuition and thought experiments are a real key to understanding uh, what this new physics looks like. Uh, basically, what I've tried to do is go down to a very deep level of particles as they move and interact with this energy, the zero-point energy of space. And um, in my picture, they're interacting with the distant matter. The electrons that are very far away are interacting with the ones that are nearby. And it's that interaction of all the particles in the universe that really are causing things that happen from moment to moment. That gives you a way for consciousness to affect the motions and to change the behavior of particles, and therefore change physics. One of the key pieces of this model is one that uh, Feynman and his advisor John Wheeler proposed back in the 40s, which is if you allow light to travel backwards in time as well as forwards in time, you can have interactions between things that are very far away, and yet the interactions can be meaningful interactions. Uh, one more piece of this model is that things travel very rapidly uh, at small distances, and therefore they interact with things in the direction that they're traveling. They have tunnel vision. So you sort of interact with things in, only in the direction you're traveling. And what that leads to is the idea of a synchronizing principle, that only the particles that happen to be moving toward each other in any given instant 
can see each other, can interact with each other. What that means is that there'll be a set of particles that'll end up moving in a synchronized way in little orbits, little tiny little self-orbits that are all coupled and synchronized together. Those are the ones that see each other. They experience forces. You can have lots of other particles that you don't see. They only contribute a random effect. That's the quantum noise in this model. And so you have a subset which is synchronized and uh, it's like a fan with a strobe light. When the strobe is synchronized with the fan blades, you can see the fan, it appears solid. Um, so our universe becomes like a sheet of paper in a stack. In our sheet of paper, the particles are all synchronized. They say, you're real, I'm real, I feel a force. But you can have many other sheets of paper, parallel universes, that we don't really see. Normally, we're unaware of them, but they're going along quite happily by themselves. Subtle energies are involve things that are coupled between these sheets of paper. It's a higher dimensional energy that couples these motions together. So it allows for a model where there are parallel realities. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing with the paranormal uh, is the interaction of these higher dimensional realities. And uh, I think Richard also mentioned Flatland and Abbott. And in that case, there was a higher dimensional reality, namely a sphere that intruded on this normal two-dimensional world and caused great consternation because they could not explain these hyperdimensional effects that showed up. So this is a way of uh, of, of developing a model that allows us to explain consciousness, explain paranormal effects, and a lot of the things that uh, we're seeing now in this new physics are DNA couples in a very natural way with the vibrations of distant matter and explains why humans are able to couple in and affect the distant matter in a very real way. The model explains sacred geometry, it explains the power of consciousness and visualization, and it also explains how uh, ESP effects can operate over huge distances, PK effects over huge distances, and even in terms of time, they can operate backwards in time as well as forwards in time because it's a holographic focusing that really is exerting the effect. Uh, it also explains how teleportation, bilocation, and even warp jumps would be possible in this model. So I'm just going to uh, just to conclude, uh, as Robert Monroe said, we're more than our physical bodies. Through prayer, vi meditation, visualization, we can create the world we want. As Victor Hugo said, all the armies of the world are not as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Thank you very much. And, and the website is there on the last frame. So if you have questions, contact me. Thank you. Take this off. Thank you.